this is a profoundly different country from the one that was imagined and promised in its freedom struggle led by Mahatma Gandhi and written into its constitution. India, it was pledged, would be a humane and inclusive country, assuring equal citizenship in every way for people of every faith, caste, gender, language, culture, ethnicity. It would not matter which God you worship or if you worship no God, you would be an equal citizen in every way. What led to the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi just months after India won her freedom? It was this insistence on humane and inclusive citizenship, particularly that India would belong equally to its Muslim citizens as it does to all others. He believed in this idea of in India so deeply that he was willing even to give up his life for this. It is important to look back with immense gratitude, not just as Indians, but of all of humankind everywhere, I believe, for the immense moral courage that he demonstrated at the time of India's freedom and partition. Imagine that a million people uh, had died in Hindu-Muslim riots at that time. Some 14, 15 million people were displaced. It was the largest displacement in human history, uh, including my own family who was in what is now in Pakistan. Uh, rivers of blood were flowing. There was rage, there were anger, there were literally millions of refugees. And it was, you know, the, the mood was that it, Pakistan is a country based on religion, there's a Muslim Pakistan, so India would be a, a, a Hindu nation. But Gandhi and the founders of our constitution, Dr. Ambedkar, our first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, were insistent that no India would belong equally uh, to all its citizens, including its Muslim citizens. But the Hindutva, Hindu supremacist project is very different. It requires a radical, violent rupture between India's Hindus and those of the hated others that it constructs, India's Muslims and India's Christians. India's immense tragedy today is that people steeped deeply in the Hindu supremacist ideology that spurred Gandhi's killing are in fact ruling India today. They seek an India that belongs most to its caste Hindus, in this alternative imagination for India, Muslims and Christians, but also Dalits, may be allowed by them uh, to live in India, but only as second class citizenships in fear and always subordinate to the Hindu majority without equal rights. But their true preference is that they should be expelled. India, India's leaders today are more determined than ever to push India down this horrific path of hate, uh, fear, and blood. We might ask, is it correct to believe that India is in real and present danger of a genocide? Many early signs of such possible violent catastrophes are visible everywhere in India today. You only need the eye to see uh, the heart to care, and the courage to call out your warning. Uh, let me, in, in the few minutes I have, give only a few examples of these early signs. There's a stunning rise in toxic hate speech by senior leaders of government and political parties. Uh, it has been calculated there's been a 1,130% increase in, uh, in, since Modi came to power in 2014, compared to the uh, preceding regime of hate speech by senior leaders, led sometimes by the prime minister, but much more shrilly by his home minister and several union and chief ministers. This hate speech pandemic stigmatizes, taunts, insults, and sometimes openly incites violence against India's Muslims. They falsely construct and depict Muslims as bigoted, violent oppressors of Hindus in human history, as breakers of Hindu temples, and in contemporary times, variously as infiltrators, unpatriotic, loyal to Pakistan, terrorists, sexual predators, 
love jihadis, cow killers, child breeders, and infiltrators. Christians are portrayed as deviously deploying overseas donations to bribe impoverished people into converting to Christianity under the cloak of humanitarian services. Even Mother Teresa is not exempt from this hate construction years after she left us. Online and in public gatherings, a range of other extreme right-wing supporters, not just the top leaders, from people in saffron robes, jobless youth to upmarket tech doyens are even more candid in spouting their hate, openly calling for boycotts and expulsions, mass killing, genocide, and mass rape. Sometimes for the record, a thin official line is claimed uh, from these so-called fringe elements. But this claim wears thin because hate mongers are rarely punished and get bail quickly if they are arrested, but mostly they are instead inducted into high party positions. Even the prime minister follows some of the most poisonous hate spreaders on, on Twitter. Other signs of dread of this pandemic of relenting hate is violence targeting India's Muslims. Brutal lynching, eerily reminiscent of Jim Crow's America, have become increasingly routine. Mobs surround and brutally kill Muslim and sometimes Dalit men on unproved charges of cow slaughter. And all of this is gleefully videotaped and circulated on social media, consumed by millions. A child is beaten somewhere for drinking water in a temple, a youth somewhere else for daring to sell bangles to Hindu girls, another for selling meat. But increasingly, people are being thrashed and even killed only and only for the crime of being visibly Muslim or for operating Christian places of worship. Most worrying are state actions that openly target Muslims. Kashmir, India's only Muslim majority state is among the most militarized regions in the world. I'm worried also in particular about the potential impact of the Citizenship Amendment Act of 2019, which for the first time gives undocumented people of Muslim faith lesser rights to access citizenship. Genocide Watch draws ominous parallels of this with Myanmar, where the Rohingya were first declared non-citizens, then brutally attacked and expelled. The prospect of the implementation of the National Register of Indian Citizens in conjunction with the Citizenship Amendment Act is rendered even more nightmarish for its frightening echoes of the Nuremberg laws of Nazi Germany. Many governments are passing so-called love jihad laws that enable the police to criminalize Muslim men who consensually marry Hindu women. In the run-up to the elections to India's largest state, Uttar Pradesh, the BJP manifesto promises jail sentences of 10 years for so-called love jihad. Large numbers are imprisoned in this state, even under national security laws, for allegedly trading in beef without ever explaining how even if they were doing this, how does this violate the country's security? The Chief Minister of Assam launches a drive to collective, selectively clear farm encroachments by Muslims and announces that these lands would be allotted to indigenous people. I could continue for hours. It is tempting for supporters of the ruling establishment to dismiss claims of possible genocide as alarmist, mischievous, and motivated so-called foreign interference and not as they are efforts to alert the national conscience. But the Holocaust Memorial Museum report warns of the dangers of such denial. They say, we know from the Holocaust what can happen when early warning signs go unheeded. I am speaking, I'm in Germany for a few months, trying to learn from the German people how they courageously confronted their horrific Nazi past. East German pastor Sean Meller speaking to uh, Susan Neimer of what other countries can learn from Germany said something very important. You can learn, he said, that no country, no culture, no religion is immune to falling into the abyss into which we fell. And once it begins, there will always be people who shut down their conscience and side with the strong man. Can we recognize that our leaders have taken India to the very edge of this abyss? My desperate hope is only that enough of us in India and around the world 
don't shut down our conscience.